the revelation. I'm a little early in my celebrating. I started celebrating Christmas about, I think it's about a month ago now. <laughs> so, I'm a little far ahead of you guys. I even built a, a little sign that counts down the days till Christmas and put it in my front yard. So, that's how much of a Christmas fanatic I am. And so, it's been Christmas for me since, I think, was it September 17th? I call it, I call it 100 Days of Christmas. So, uh, and then my wife finally jumped in and, and started decorating the stairwell. Uh, I think it's been two weeks ago now, maybe a little more. <coughs> so, Merry Christmas. <laughs> We're going to jump right in. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pray before we get started. I don't think I need all this. Heavenly Father, <coughs> we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this moment. Lord oh God, we thank you, Lord God, for another opportunity, Lord God, to gain understanding from you, Lord God, another opportunity to bring glory to your throne, Lord Jesus, just another opportunity to just say thank you, Father. Lord oh God, we thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord Jesus. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives, Lord Jesus. And we ask, Lord oh God, that you be here in this moment, Father. Your word says, oh God, that you inhabit the praises of your people, Father. So, oh God, I ask that you inhabit the praises that we've given you, oh God, in this service, oh God. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to speak to us clearly, Father. Oh God, your word says, oh God, that you can teach us, that your Holy Spirit is a teacher, oh God. So I ask, oh God, that you teach us, give us understanding, oh God, give us insight, give us revelation, oh God. I ask, oh God, personally, oh God, that I decrease, oh God, that you increase. Lord God, that not my ideas will come forth, Lord Jesus, and nor will my uh, different uh, uh, just biases and everything that I have, Lord God, will come forth, Lord God, but your word will come forth clearly in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord God, I ask that you speak. I ask that we all have ears to hear, Father. I come against anything that will seek to hinder the service, Lord God, or hinder your word coming forth, Lord God, in the mighty name of Jesus. So, when, when God gave me this word, I struggled last night. I'm a, not a procrastinator, but I know, uh, well, yeah, I am a procrastinator, but I also know that if I try to put it all together on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, it's all going to change before Sunday. And so, uh, even, even last night, I was talking to my wife and my sister and talking about, like, I think I want to change the whole sermon. No, but I can't. I already sent him the title. I'm stuck. <laughs> so uh, I struggled trying to find out how to put it all in a package that made sense. Because it made sense in my mind. And I struggled to, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, a sermon is almost a vehicle to get you to the revelation that, uh, that God has given you. And so I struggled to find the right vehicle to get us to that destination together. I even struggled with the thought, like, Lord, was this? Your word that you gave me, or is this something I just kind of came up in my own mind and tried to make sound deep? I struggled with that all last night. I didn't really start putting my sermon together until I think it was like 12 30 last night, midnight. And then I wrote it, and then I deleted it, and then I wrote it, and then I deleted it. And then I finally started to put it together. And the Lord, I finally had to take that moment and step away and try to. I'm going to really seek God's face and pray and then was able to remove all those distractions that were in my mind and, and really hear from the Lord. And, and one of the things I, I thought about last night was being the vessel that God is using is humbling, but uh, it's a frightening situation at the same time. Uh, and it can look glamorous maybe from sitting up here and having this big thing that you're standing on top of, but in reality, uh, it's, 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 it's heavy. And I, 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 I struggled and I ran from this whole idea of preaching for a long time. And not, only, not because of a fear of speaking in front of people, because at the end of the day, once you spoke in front of people, whether it's a crowd of 10 or 100, it all feels the same. It's just a whole bunch of people staring at you. It was more of a struggle of the responsibility to, to deliver 
God's word and, and that heavy load. The fear I had last night was like, Lord, am I empty enough for you to pour in your word so that your people can get a message that's not tainted? Because if I'm not empty enough and I'm not clean enough, then it's like eating a delicious meal off of a dirty plate or with a dirty fork. If you ever had a meal and you ate it on a dirty plate, the whole meal is, is definitely going to be ruined. First of all, you might not even eat it because it got stuff sticking on the plate and old cheese melted on there and all kinds of things. You're not going to eat that meal, right? Or have you ever drank water out of a cup that had coffee in it before or Gatorade or something? It, it changes the flavor of the water. And so it was my heart's desire to give you a word that God gave me with nothing at it. With no new ingredients, just God's recipe. And so with that, that, that fear and that understanding, let, let's go ahead and dive into what the Lord is saying. So in Luke 11, ch uh, chapter 11, verse 14, it's, uh, I know Pastor Scott read it, but I'm going to read it again because that's just how it works in my head. It says, one day Jesus cast out a demon from a man who couldn't speak. And when the demon was gone, the man began to speak. The crowds were amazed. But some of them said, no wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. Others trying to test Jesus demanded that he show them a, a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. And he knew their thoughts. So he said, any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. A family splintered by feuding will fall apart. You say, I am empowered by Satan. But if Satan is divided and fighting against himself, how can his kingdom survive? And if I am empowered by Satan, what about your own exorcists? They cast out demons too, so they will condemn you for what you have said. But if I am casting out demons by the power of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. Verse 21. For when a strong man is fully armed and guards his palace, his possessions are safe. Until someone even stronger attacks and overpowers him, strips him of his weapons and carries off his belongings. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me, and anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. So in the beginning of this story, we step into the scene of a praying Jesus. When we look at the full chapter, we always have to examine the full text. We walk into a scene with a praying Jesus, and when he's finished, one of his disciples sparks a lesson that we all have to gather everything we can from. He said, Lord, teach us to pray. And then Jesus said how you should pray and gives <clears throat> them uh, what we now call the Lord's Prayer, right? And then he tells them a story that gives more insight. And this is not my focus, but I, I feel it's important to say this. He says, suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight. This is in verse 5. Wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. And you say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit and I have nothing to, uh, for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom. Don't bother me. The door is locked for the night, and my family and I are all in bed, and I can't help you. I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep on knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. Now, like I said, this is not my subject, but I feel it's too important to skip past this in the passage, in the whole chapter. There's some things that sometimes that you need from God that you just got to keep on asking him. Your sense of urgency and your level of persistence speaks volumes about what you need. It's, it's not the deepness of your prayer that moves God, nor is it the how articulate you sound uh, that moves God. It's not the volume of your voice and yelling and screaming. It, it, it's the persistence that moves God. He says in this passage, his, he says, shameless persistence. So when you really, really need something from God, you got to get to the point that you don't care about the other folks around you, uh, you uh, what they think, and, and you got to press in to get what you need. Could you imagine this man banging on the door in the middle of the night? It's midnight, right? How many other neighbors did he wake? He woke up, he woke up people that were asleep while he needed to get what he needed to get. And you have to know that there will be people that are comfortable in the situation you are in need. You might have to make some people uncomfortable to get what you need. 
They might be frustrated with you. It might, uh, they might get mad at you. They might tell you to shut up, but you have to press in anyways, right? This is what, what Jesus is teaching about prayer. And he said, it makes, it makes me, it reminds me rather of uh, blind Bartimaeus. Mark 47 said, I mean, Mark uh, says in, um, says when blind Bart uh, Bartimaeus heard that Jesus Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, son of David, have mercy on me. And they told him to be quiet, right? Many other people yelled at him. They told him to be quiet. But he shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. And when Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man and, and, he, and he came to Jesus and Jesus said, cheer up. Uh, he, I'm, I'm sorry, they said, cheer up. They said, come on, he is, he's calling you. And then blind Bartimaeus threw aside his coat and jumped and came to Jesus, right? He said, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go for your faith has healed you. Instantly the man could see and he followed Jesus down the road. So sometimes people will be telling you that it doesn't take all that, right? Sometimes people will tell you uh, that it doesn't take all that and it's only because they think they have already everything they need. But when you're praying, you have to be on that by any means necessary type of level of prayer. When you really need something from God. Whatever it takes, you got to get it, right? The thing that caught me in this story was not that the man was, uh, the man was not necessarily saying no, right? He was just saying, basically, not right now, I'm asleep. My family's asleep, we're all in the bed. But it was the shameless persistence that changes his mind. And Jesus is sometimes, I mean, Jesus is saying sometimes God isn't saying no to your prayer, but he's wanting you to press in more. The more I think about that passage, I think about Abraham and his shameless persistence when he began to negotiate with God about Sodom and Gomorrah. He was persistent and he pushed God from 50 all the way down to 10. He said, you can find just 10 righteous people. Will you still save me? I can go on and on all through scripture to show you the persistence in scripture. The woman with the issue of blood that pressed through the crowd and grabbed the hem of his garment. The children of Israel walking around Jericho persistently and doing what God told them to do. I encourage you to be shameless in your, in your pers uh, persistent with your prayers. Who cares what anybody else thinks? Still press and get what you need from God. I encourage you to also be shameless in your pursuit of God. No matter what it takes, you have to press in to get what you need to get. So this is what Jesus is teaching earlier in this passage, right? Like I said, that's not my focus, but I just had to make sure I address that. So verse 14, it starts where, where my focus is. So here's a man that couldn't see. And when you look at Matthew, because all the Gospels tell some of the same stories, it says that he was blind also, right? And Jesus cast this demon out that was preventing this man from speaking. One of the things that trips me out is that the ones claiming to be the most religious in the crowd don't celebrate with this man when he gets his deliverance. He had just had a major deliverance. He couldn't speak. And then Jesus cast this demon out. And now he, what we used to have him bound is gone. But the, what the religious rulers wanted to do was discredit the miracle. Isn't it funny how folks always want to tell you that when something great happens to you that it's not that great? How quickly the enemy tries to steal your victory and, and downplay it. Don't let the enemy discredit your victory. Don't let him discredit the victory because, uh, um, because in doing so, he's trying to, do, to discredit the authentic, authenticity of the source. He knew that if he told this man that Jesus really didn't have the power to cast the demon out, then technically the man would still be bound. He knows that if he tells you that God didn't really deliver you, that it was just all in your head, then you would be known to be still bound. Hold on to the authenticity of your blessing. Yes, God did help you graduate from that college or God did help heal you and, and God did bring you out of darkness into a marvelous light. Yes, God did bring you out of that place and set you up in a whole new environment. If the devil can get you to believe that God isn't the source of your blessing and, and your talents and your gifts, then it's easy for you to think that it can be taken away. Or it's easy for you to think that it's not really that powerful. He can get you to, if he can get you to lose confidence in the blessing, then he can steal the blessing. 
But if you know that this move was God, if you know that uh, God was in it, then you know the devil can't stop you. If you know that it was God, then you know that the gates of hell will not prevail against you. If you know that it was God, then you know that nothing can stop you. No man, no woman, no beast, no demon, no things present or things to come. Nothing can stop you if you know that it was God. And if it was God, and if God didn't, then let it be so. Right? So here we are, the religious, the religious say that he's casting out demons by the power of, of Satan, and then the rest of the crowd is asking God for a sign. So why does the crowd want a sign? Is it possible that the crowd wanted a sign because they still had hopes of a coming Messiah to establish a kingdom here on earth? Is it possible that the Jews still had not realized what God had been trying to establish all along? All the way from the Old Testament to this present time. So Jesus goes on to talk about a kingdom and division. Jesus said a kingdom divided by a civil war is doomed or a family splintered by feud will fall apart. So let's stay there for a few minutes. A kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. A family splintered by feud will fall apart. Jesus is refuting the claim that he can cast out a demon by the power of the demon. But is it possible that this statement today is an indictment on us? Not us in the sense of this broader community, not us in the sense of Newton, Kansas, or Harvey County, or Kansas, not even us in the sense of the United States of America. But could it be an indictment on us as the body of Christ? What are we going to do about this division in the body of Christ? Are we going to allow the hate in our hearts and outside forces to, to, to continue to divide us? Our culture loves to treat the symptoms and not the root cause of things. I could address the issues going on in our country, in our world, but the root is us. We as a body of Christ should be setting the tone and setting the example for the world outside of us. But we, in the body of Christ, are a fractured family, divided by few. Feuding about ideas, doctrine, race, different principles that we stand on. Feuding about fears, politics, pain, history, news channels, feuding about all these different things, and we are consistently and constantly divided. Is it possible that Satan's kingdom is more functional than ours? Is it possible that Satan's kingdom is more functional than the body of Christ? Jesus says, don't fight against each other, right? Jesus says the devil doesn't fight against another devil. Basically, he says that demons stick together. But us, in the body of Christ, we are constantly fighting each other. Doctrine against doctrines, and uh, church against church, communities against communities. We gotta stop. If there's anything that should unite us, it is our love for Jesus and our neighbors and our end goal of spreading the gospel. One of the things that really divides us is our misconception about this kingdom. Our misconception of thinking that this is the kingdom. Somewhere down the line, we join the Israelites in the confusion of thinking that this is it. Sometimes we behave and think as if America is the kingdom of God. And it's not. So Jesus says, but if I'm casting out demons by the power of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. For when a strong man is fully armed and guards his palace, his possessions are safe until someone stronger or even stronger attacks him and overpowers him and strips him of his weapons and carries off all of his belongings. This week in Bible study, I was trying to teach the concept that the Bible always bears witness of itself, right? You can read a concept in the New Testament and then see it lived out in the Old Testament. And it goes back and forth constantly, right? And so when I read this, it takes me back all the way to Samuel. 
when the children of Israel lost the Ark of the Covenant in the battle of the Philistines. And the Philistines thought that they had some simple uh, spoils of war, and they, and they thought they had a relic, right? So they take this Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, and they throw it in the Temple of Dagon and went about their business. And what that did for me was it started to expose a revelation that I would not have gathered otherwise. And I would not have been able to relate it to Luke. As the story goes, they came back the next day after they took the Ark of the Covenant and threw it in the Temple of Dagon. Came back the next day and Dagon, the idol, was face down before the Ark of the Lord. So they thinking that it was just by chance that this happened, they set Dagon back up in its place. The next day they came into the temple and the idol was face down, but this time the idol was missing his head and his arms, and nothing was left but the stump. Now remember, what did Jesus just tell us about the king? He said, for when a strong man is fully armed and guards his palace, his possessions are safe until someone even stronger attacks him and overpowers him and strips him of his weapons and carries off all of his belongings. So Dagon in this temple, Dagon was thought to be the father deity of Baal. He was the Philistines' chief deity, their, 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 the king of all their gods. Yet when the Ark of the Covenant is placed in the same temple, the chief god, the, the king of their gods, is face down because of something stronger than he. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one true God, the one only living God, strips him of his weapons, and he is overpowered. And then it says that the Philistines put the ark on a cart with some gifts. So God carries off in the cart, in the ark, with all of the Philistines' belongings, right? Some gifts. Unknowingly, the Philistines learned a lesson that the children of Israel had not yet learned, a lesson that they still had learned in Luke 11, a lesson that we still have not learned in the body of Christ. The ark was basically a portable throne, and God said in, in Exodus that from above the mercy seat of the ark, that he would give all his commands for Israel. So wherever the ark went, that became his kingdom. Wherever the ark went, that's where his reign was. The part, uh, they were part of a limitless kingdom. This is what the Israelites didn't realize. A limitless kingdom, a kingdom that has no boundaries. It only makes sense that God's kingdom will be limitless because he is limitless. He knows no boundaries. Because its king is limitless, the kingdom of the kingdom of it, it, it knows no boundaries. So why would God, a limitless God, restrict himself to a finite kingdom within walls? And here we are thinking that we can restrict God into four walls or restrict God into a doctrine or restrict God into a denomination. How often do we in our minds try to boil God down to a reduction? His kingdom, his reign, and his authority knows no limits, no borders, no boundaries. When the Pharisees asked Jesus in Luke 7, uh, 17, when will the kingdom come? Still, still oblivious to this, to this revelation. They said, when will the kingdom come? And Jesus lets them know that the kingdom is within you. The children of Israel carried this ark wherever they went and set it and God would rule and reign. They missed this revelation that the kingdom has no borders. The ark was just a portable throne and now you have that portable throne in your heart once you give it over to God. And from there, just like the ark, the covenant, the ark of the covenant, he will give you all his commands and meet you there. Can you take a moment to just realize that? That God is making your heart his throne. Right? Making your heart the meeting place where he can rule and give you all his commands for your life. Making your heart the meeting place where he can give you every command for your life and then everywhere that you carry it becomes his kingdom. The word kingdom is used in this, in this uh, passage uh, in the Greek means his reign, his, his rule, his right to rule and have authority. So everywhere you go becomes his kingdom. Everywhere you go, you carry his power and authority. No matter where you're going, no matter what you're going through, no matter the situation, no matter the circumstance, no matter how big it may seem, you carry a kingdom and the verse says that Jesus can overpower the strong man that's in your life. 
We all have different strong men that we battle. And God's able to overpower that, is what he says in Luke uh, chapter 11. He can overpower that and not only overpower it, but he can also take away the weapons that are coming against you. I know the Bible says in Isaiah, it says that no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against thee in judgment, thou shalt be dealt with. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. The righteousness is in me, says the Lord. God says that he can take away the weapons. Right? He can disarm the thing that you're fighting. If we can get this understanding, we can start to knowingly and intentionally carry his kingdom into all the places that we go. We can carry his kingdom into work into schools. We can carry his kingdom into every meeting place that brings you anxiety. You can carry his kingdom. We carry his authority and his power into every area of our lives that have a strong man and he can overpower it. If we can catch this revelation, no matter what happens around us, no matter what happens this week or the weeks to come, no matter uh, anything that's going on in our lives, we know that we carry a kingdom with a king that knows no boundaries. We carry a kingdom that has a king that is limitless. We can carry a king, uh, a kingdom that is limitless and knows no boundaries because it's not an ordinary kingdom. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, for who you are. Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, for what you've said and what you've given us, Lord God. Knowing, Lord God, that your kingdom is not a physical kingdom, Father, that it doesn't have drawbridges and walls, Lord God, that it's not made of brick and mortar, Lord God, but your kingdom, Lord God, is your reign here on earth, Lord God, and we carry that everywhere we go. Knowing, Lord God, that you, Lord God, are the absolute authority in the earth, Lord Jesus. Knowing, Lord God, that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, Lord God, that we carry you in every situation. That circumstances don't matter in your kingdom, Lord God, because, Lord God, you can overpower every strong man, Lord God. You can overpower him and take all the weapons that come against us, Lord Jesus. Lord God, I ask that you give us understanding, Lord God, that despite what may happen in our lives, Lord God, despite what's going on in our communities, in our country, Lord God, that we are a part of a kingdom that is not ordinary. We are a part of a kingdom that has a king, a God, that is omnipresent and all-powerful. I thank you, Lord God, I ask that you give us understanding of that, that we find peace in that, knowing, Lord God, that no matter what happens in our lives, Lord God, no matter what happens around us, Lord God, that at no point in time, have you been dethroned? That you are all powerful. That you're the greatest spirit in the universe. In Jesus' name.